Uh, welcome to uh, Making Better Motion Branding. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking how we're using uh, Blender for motion graphics. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Philip, Mc Philip McCluskey. I am the motion design lead at Launch by NTT Data. Um, I've been in the 3D industry for a lot of years now. Um, started off in a couple other 3D platforms, but really have been getting to learn Blender a lot more, and I find myself just gravitating towards it and using it um, whenever I can, even if the situation doesn't uh, call for it, but I'm just, I can't get enough of it. So with that, I'll uh, let my colleague introduce himself. Hello, I'm John Einselin. I'm the Motion Design uh, Technical Director at Launch, and I've been working in media production and graphics and tech art for a couple decades now. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're super excited to share some of the stuff we've been doing in Blender, uh, specifically related to brand design this year. So uh, Philip is going to kind of talk about working with our brand design team. Uh, we're going to go over some of the explorations that we did in Blender, trying to find the motion language for this brand. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about motion math and thinking about time as an, as an ascending float. Uh, that's kind of a key concept for a lot of our procedural systems. Uh, and then we're going to show a couple implementations of how we have turned some of our explorations into very efficient event packages. Uh, and then, of course, touching just a little bit on some of the limitations when we are using Blender for all of our motion graphics, not just 3D, but motion graphics itself. So, yeah. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, before I dive into um, the design and language and stuff we, we're going to be discussing, uh, Launch by NTT Data. Who is that? Um, we uh, were acquired by NTT Data, and they acquired a bunch of other design studios, and they've uh, formed them into the Launch Design Studio, um, where we do a lot of design. Um, we're an innovation company. Um, so that's all you need to know about launch. Um, so moving forward, uh, brand design, UX, UI design systems. Um, myself, I don't come from a design background. I'm um, more traditional 3D. Um, so getting into a design system, uh, I didn't really know what that was. Um, and so we'll discuss that. Um, but. Uh, Kicking off the design system was led by our team. Uh, we have an amazing team of designers at launch, um, so I just want to mention a couple of them. Uh, first off is X Miller. He's the, um, our lead designer uh, who started this branding initiative, and he really set the tone and foundation of where we were going with the designs. And then we have Ken McGrath come in, and he uh, uh, carried on where uh, X had uh, set the uh, set the foundation and carried us forward, um, and we were had a really good opportunity to uh, for on the motion side of things to uh, get in there and uh, you know set the tone of our motion early, uh, which is something that we don't really get to do a lot on the design. So it was really great that we were able to do that early on this. So the design system that I'm going to be showing you is for our um, branding for with a with a new company. We need new branding. We need a new website, and we need marketing materials. So a design system. Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly, but um, we're looking at Figma here, and it's our style guide um, that we're using for our uh, website. So a style uh, style guide or design system. What is that? It's basically just your colors, your typography. Um, and how you're using um, those elements, those components um, throughout your brand. Uh, so this is just uh, all that information, these components, and how uh, that you know how they're going to be used. What's their structure look like? And then you're taking those and you're scaling out and you're making wireframes. Um, uh, you're doing a, and the designers. I'm showing what I'm showing here is all the iterations that they're doing. They do a lot of iterations of how they want to use those components, how how uh, how the layouts are going to be. Um, so they go from wireframes, we move those into, we start adding a little bit more imagery to them, starting to flesh them out a little bit more, and we move those into high fidelities, adding a lot more imagery with our um, iconography uh, and those components that we laid out, and we start to see um, finished results of what that website's going to, how the website's going to appear. Uh, so I'm just showing a lot, a lot of iteration uh, that they do. 
Um, there's a lot of design uh, designers that are involved, a lot of talented people, uh, so I just want to highlight them. Uh, so after we uh, get brand design set up, uh, motion language. What is motion language? It's basically just how do you describe the brand? Is the brand, um, you know, playful and energetic, or is it more reserved and minimalistic? Uh, so you just want to be able to just describe what that, what the motion is. In our situation here, um, we're using a five by five grid system to for all of our iconography and um, uh, the logo. So. In that, there's just kind of a uh, emotion that's already kind of uh, kind of already resonates there. Um, but we also need to, uh, you know, be able to describe what our motion is. So in Launch's situation, we're very much a, an eclectic group of different uh, capabilities and skill sets, and we do a lot of different styles of work. So we want to be able to represent that in our motion in our um, imagery. <clears throat> so. We just laid out a lot of different uh, inspirations and ideas, and um, where can we go with uh, with the motion? Um, so w we can be organic and fluid with it, or we can also be a little bit more rigid and structured, depending on the application uh, or how we want to use that that design. Uh, so again, we're still in Figma, showing lots of just iterations and uh, getting general ideas uh, out. So we've established motion language, and now we're going to move into inspiration and uh, direction. So here we're just going to grab tons of inspiration from around, from photography, real-time 3D, video, um, um, artwork, uh, um, even uh, sculptures and, and the such. We're just pouring out lots of, uh, getting lots of inspiration laid out, and then we're noting uh, you know what we what speaks to us what's what's resonating with us what's what can we use and where can we apply these types of motions um, so we're building them out um, getting ideas together from slide puzzles to icon reveals to uh, flipping tiles and other 3d uh, kind of styles uh, and then we're making kind of our priority list of what's going to be our high priority what do we need to focus on immediately what can we get uh, get out uh, get moving on um, and then that took us into, after we established all these uh, different ideas um, and inspirations, uh, we're setting up two, two sets here. We're setting up primary brand motion and secondary brand motion. The primary brand motion is what are we going to be using for the face uh, on all of our branding, what's going to be on the website. Uh, and then our secondary motion is going to be uh, what are those experimental ideas that we really love, but we don't really have a, a this kind of a more of a niche, uh, uh, you know, what are we, where can we use those somewhere else, but still uh, put the work in and put the exploration in and try to develop those ideas. <clears throat> so uh, we've done all that exploration or uh, inspiration. Now we're going to do the exploration of a few of those primary and secondary designs. So we're gonna be walking through a few examples of how we're using Blender to uh, start to iterate on those ideas and, and develop them further. For, so for example one, <clears throat> um, I could have used any other program for this. This is just kind of getting, I want to get uh, my ideas of motion out as quickly as possible. But I know eventually that I'm going to move into 3D. So I'm grabbing the 5x5 five five, uh, glyph icon and making the, th the three elements that I need, which is just those that, that basic square, a rounded square, and another rounded one. Getting them into 3D because I know I'm going to go there eventually. And starting to get motion out as quickly as I, as I can. So this is just real simple animations that I'm just chucking out uh, you know, really, really quickly. Um, and Blender's a great tool, animation tool for that, and I'm just getting myself more familiar with the tools. Um, but uh, I really just like, like I said, being in Blender, it's just great. Um, so uh, getting those motions out really, really quick. And one of the features that I do like about Blender that I'm always just toggling on is motion pathing. Um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with it, but I need to, I'm a very visual person and I need to, you know, visualize where my animations are going. Uh, I don't just, I can't just, I'm not a, you know, a good animator, I guess. So I can't just like put things where, you know, where they need to go and, and send it. So I like to visualize it. Um, and uh, so that for this first example, this is just all hand keyframing. Uh, it's real, just dirty animation. Uh, John's going to be going through um, a much more procedural system in building out those uh, those tool sets so that uh, 
you can make updates and iterations on your animation ideas uh, versus mine, which are kind of one-offs or just dirty animations. We're getting ideas out as quickly as possible. Um, and so I've just set up a simple, you know, uh, the render's just coming out 2D, flat shading. Um, so it just looks 2D. I could have done it somewhere else. But in, when I do want to make this 3D, it's, I already have some of the elements there. So um, doing that quick iteration is just, just easy. So I'll have John come up here and uh, walk us through the next couple of examples. Thanks, Philip. Yeah. Um, yeah, as we were exploring the brand, we went through all sorts of ideas. <laughs> um, and some of these were very much 2D approaches. This is just a, a simple array of uh, elements that are using UV scrolling to animate some icons across and transition between one glyph into another. Um, a lot of our explorations were trying to figure out, like, how do we introduce a glyph? How do we animate between these, you know, five by five grid glyphs? Uh, and so this is kind of using some techniques that we would typically use in, say, like a real-time game engine, because we do a lot of our own real-time development as well. Uh, and part of that is using uh, RGB texture packing, um, another technique from real-time graphics where you need to fit as much information as you can into a single texture call. Uh, but by using, you know, just overlaid renders with red, green, and blue channels, we can fit multiple masks into a single texture. It simplifies some of our shader setups, uh, and it's a pretty standardized workflow for a lot of the stuff that we do. So using that in combination with some you know, shader setups uh, and then a whole lot of geometry nodes, uh, this is a concept that was very much based on like elastic columns where we wanted a band of color to kind of transition between different glyph elements. Uh, and yeah, so this is using a, dy a dynamic uh, time input with float curve nodes for all of the timing and behavior of the animation uh, and an accumulate field node to ensure that we can take these values for each of these elements, add them up, normalize, and make sure that everything actually stays within the window and all of the elasticity of the column you know, fits together. It's a 2D effect that we're rendering out, but of course it's all 3D geometry in Blender, and it made it a lot easier to kind of manage things and of course approaching things more dynamically, more procedurally, more generatively can be really powerful when we're dealing with something that is an array. And that's where Blender really shines uh, with a lot of things that other packages that ever worked um, might struggle with. So this is something that can be really, really powerful even if the effects themselves are purely two-dimensional. Um, and so, yeah, this is the result. And it's you know very easily editable as well, like the, the direction of the effect or completely randomize it, things like that. Uh, but as we're talking about 2D effects and 2D graphics and working with a design team that really appreciates you know very strong graphic contrasts and uh, stuff like that, we also were starting to bridge between 2D and 3D a little bit. Uh, and with that five by five grid, it works really well with a cube. It's a lot of fun to play with. Uh, this entire design system. Um, and so this was one of the concepts that we came up with. We wanted to create a 2D glyph that rotated in 3D to form another 2D glyph. Uh, and that works, you know, reasonably well. We can just render it out with a flat emission shader, but the 3D part really needs a little bit more depth. And so we used an animated occlusion. We did all of our shading within the material itself and just animated the occlusion on and off as we are starting to rotate and then as we stop the rotation, it's all completely gone. So that way it doesn't ruin the illusion of a flat two-dimensional glyph. Uh, and of course, doing a cube, like the first two sides are easy, uh, relatively. You can kind of figure out how to position everything and it works out okay. But that third side is a nightmare. Thankfully, the solution is you just, because it's 2D at that point, when it's you know flat facing the uh, orthographic camera, you just do a little magic trick in a single frame, you rearrange everything. <laughs> and then you have a looping animation. Uh, combined with that, we wanted to add more color, but we only wanted the color in the transition itself. And so this is just a geometry, set, uh, geometry node setup that allows us to select which side of the cube stays white 
and all the other sides are randomly uh, sorted into different brand colors. And so then this is the result. So that's where we are trying to combine some of the 2D looks that we're getting from design, and we want to continue to use that flat 2D look, but then add a lot more depth to it. So this was one of the concepts that we really enjoyed playing with. Um, but as we are using Blender for motion graphics and all of that, there's a lot more that Blender can do that a lot of other you know, standard motion graphic packages might kind of struggle with. So over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, so with motion graphics, uh, a common element is uh, physics-based uh, simulations. And there's a lot of other packages that you know, either you need an add-on or it's, it's not as efficient. Um, so something that Blender excels at um, is one of those. So uh, we had an inspiration for a, like a particle logo. And this, this starts to move away from our 5x5 five five grid. Um, but we're still, it's just our logo. So uh, I was able to just quickly, um, and I'm, I'm all about just quick iterations, is I was able to set up a, just a container, um, add basic particles to it, dump them in there, uh, throw in a couple turbulence fields, and you know, kind of play around with their animations and make them a little bit more organic. And there we go, um, I'm matching the inspiration. Um, but you know, with exploration, we want to take those designs um, a, a little further. So um, in this uh, just basic setup, when I just dumped the cube in there or the, the L mark in there, uh, there's some there's some tight little corners and uh, some of the particles are getting hung up, and I and I don't really like the feel of it. So um, I can just easily take that L mark, start to round out those corners and remove some of the pinch points for the particles so things can move around. And, and again, this Blender is just you know easy to, to make those edits um, versus other packages where you may have you know, some challenges to deal with. Um, so here we see that I've rounded out those, uh, those corners. Um, I've added in the, uh, the branding colors and then I've started to reduce the, the particle count to kind of just give the uh, the vibe of the, the, the L mark um, because it very much was, this is one of our more experimental, you know, kind of anim motions. Um, so after setting that, in, uh, setting that up, um, playing around with the, the motion a little bit more and just kind of, we're getting the vibe. Um, this is kind of one of our, our niche case, you know, uses. Um, and I, I don't really like the, the branding colors. It's not really working for this situation. So, uh, which is, it was, the material's just set up with an easy ramp. Um, uh, so it's just giving some random color to particles. We can usually just swap that out and do a more of a monotone. Um, so that's kind of where we ended up with uh, with this L mark that is um, it's floating around. It could use you know in random uh, uh, internal like powerpoints and stuff like that. So it's nice to see. Um, so we have another example. Yeah, uh, and something that you know we we wouldn't try at all to do in a motion graphics package is like full 3D scene build out, uh, and this is a concept that was kind of started in the design team, uh, looking at the brand as a window into another world or revealing a new concept or idea, um, and so we really approached this just more like a kit bashing setup where we are taking assets from Silva 3D and Polyhaven and other sources like that and just building out a full 3D scene using you know, very dramatic lighting that kind of splits that boundary between inside and outside and kind of pulls the two together a little bit. Uh, and this imagery is, is kind of a, a key point throughout the entire website design using you know, stock photography and graphics and other elements that are being cropped and revealed by different glyphs. Uh, and so this was kind of a, a really key visual for the brand and uh, a very key direction that a lot of the graphics took. Uh, but from here, we started really working into actual production of assets to be used on the website. And as part of that, we really needed uh, you know, a hero banner for the website that was gonna be cool and incorporate a wide variety of styles, um, you know, trying to get to the eclectic nature of the brand where we're an innovation development company. We do a whole bunch of different things web, mobile, a lot of extended reality, stuff like that. So uh, we just set up a very simple library uh, file in Blender. So that's our standardized camera animation for the website banner. Uh, and then that animation could then be linked in a wide variety of projects. We could you know, take that same animation, scale it, rotate it, et cetera, until you know, everything lined up perfectly. 
Uh, and then all we had to do was, you know, render out the frame range that we needed so we had flawless match cuts through the entire video. And these, uh, yeah, so this is uh, the result. This is the launch by NTT data website banner that uh, should be revealed soon on the new website once it is published. Uh, and so all of those animations are created in Blender. Um, of course, a lot of the things that we're showing uh, in our sizzle reel is all like we have our hands in a lot of projects. Uh, like I said, we do a lot of extended reality work and a uh, whole lot of development projects. Uh, and we're using Blender for quite a bit, if not all of that now. And uh, so this seamlessly loops, but it brings up a really interesting point. Um, like, why does automation matter? Uh, I, I do tend to build a lot of systems and geometry nodes. Um, and why does that matter? Well, it, it matters because uh, one of the most common animations we have to do in motion graphics is we have a wall of logos and we need to animate all of them. And while, you know, in a layer-based system, I might, you know, write a, an expression uh, to, like, take, you know, an animation keyframe, then offset it correctly and all of that, and then I have to duplicate that for all of my layers. Blender makes that so much easier to just define all of that behavior once in a geometry node system and apply that to an array. We can just import all of our SVGs. We, we have vectors in Blender. It works. Just import the SVGs, drop them into a collection, attach them to the array, and you're done. Um, and being able to work that way more programmatically, more generatively, can be incredibly powerful for motion graphics. So value-driven animation, and I mentioned this at the start as well, thinking of time as an ascending float. Uh, we talk about floating, number, floating point numbers a lot in real-time uh, game development, uh, and it's just, you know, zero to one or beyond, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it's pretty obvious if we have linear keyframes, you know, starting at zero, going up to one, that's, that's a number that's going, you know, it's just animating from zero to one. We can replicate this pretty easily using drivers, just taking the current frame and dividing it by 30 in this case. We're animating from frame zero to frame 30, that's our duration. Um, and we can do that in geometry nodes as well, of course. So we can use the scene time node, take the current frame, uh, divide it by our desired duration, and that gives us a zero to one animation. But of course, I mean, what animation starts on frame zero? <laughs> um, so we need to be able to then, you know, control when this procedural animation starts. So we just need to subtract the frame we want to start on from the current frame. So if the frame is currently 15 and we want to start on frame 15, if we subtract 15 from 15, we get zero. So that, you know, works out pretty well. Uh, and then, of course, we can just clamp it so that way our procedural animation isn't starting at like negative something and going, you know, infinitely in the positive direction. Uh, so yeah, that's a quick way to start a procedural animation in geometry nodes. And of course, we can also add in, you know, the behavior of the animation. Uh, we, we may use, you know, zero to one as a standardized input value for our timeline inside of, after, inside of uh, geometry nodes, but then the float curve gives us, you know, ease in, ease out. But you will notice that this separates the timing of this timeline and the behavior of the timeline, which means that we can add a bounce without changing anything else. All we do is swap out that curve. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we can change the, the start frame or we can change the duration. That same bounce animation can now be a different length. It can start at a different time. And that's really the start to where we are approaching, you know, how to animate an array. So here's an example of, you know, just a, a bunch of little spheres attached to an array of points. Uh, they're being instanced, nothing, you know, too complicated there, but they're all animating in at the same time. And the goal, of course, is to offset a lot of animations and that kind of thing. And in other, you know, motion graphic packages, that's a pretty standard setup. Uh, you need to be able to, you know, animate a whole bunch of things and offset them, and there are plugins to help with that and all of that. But managing it in a single system that is easily updated, it's a whole new level. <laughs> Why would I ever go back? Uh, and so in this case, we're taking the index of the element, the point that things are going to be instanced on, 
Uh, we're going to take the total number of points and divide the index by that so we get a standardized zero to one range of indices. And then we can simply subtract that from our time because you know our time is also zero to one and then feed that into our float curve that's giving us that really strong ease in. And now suddenly everything is animating in, uh, you know, with a, a nice little gradient just based on the index of the points that things are being instanced on. Uh, but we can just swap that out for random and now everything is animating in randomly. And you can do this with, you know, use the X and Y or Z positions to like, create, you know, volumetric gradients or use the proximity to a, an empty element that you're moving around the scene to create proximity animations and all of that. You can change, you know, even the duration if you kind of like swap around how some of the nodes are set up. You can do it that way. This is an incredibly flexible system. Um, and of course, you know, it'll get more complex as you build out an actual, you know, animation for a system. Um, and so this is implementing, you know, some rotation and some uh, positional changes for elements along with, you know, all of the curves to control the behavior of those uh, animations. And if this looks, you know, a little bit familiar to you, it should because this is our presentation. It's all built in Blender. We have everything timed out to markers on the timeline and that segments our renders. Uh, but for a little bit more on how we use uh, this kind of approach for brand animation and then motion graphics in other events. Pass it over to Philip. So like uh, John said, uh, we use it for a lot of um, uh, production. So uh, at launch, we have a lot of um, internal meetings and virtual meetings. Um, and in one of the instances, we have an event called Launch Live. It's every, um, it's every month, um, but it's a virtual um, meeting. So we need graphics for it. And we are usually build on, are, you know, booked on client work, so we don't have a lot of time to be uh, making, these, uh, making these updates, um, but I'll get into that momentarily. So Launch Live. Um, uh, here we have OBS, and we're just throwing, we have a bunch of scenes in here, so we can easily throw in our, you know, the, the waiting room, um, welcome screens, titles, uh, and agendas. And so we have these procedural graphics that are running in the background, and we have individual titles for each screen. Um, and uh, note that each background is unique to what titles on screen. So um, in Blender, we have a nice system set up so that these are easily uh, updatable and generatable. So I'll just dive through how that set what that setup looks like. So um, again, uh, procedural system, uh, geometry nodes are set up to just randomly generate these backgrounds for us. Um, and we uh, have these all set up in containers so uh, we have a, you know, a, a parent container and then we have individual containers per scene that we want. Um, so we're using the same background on all the, uh, all the uh, containers or you know, all the images. Um, so then we have individual titers that are in their e own unique uh, little container. And these are easily updatable and everything's linked. So you just, if it's uh, the same speaker as on the agenda, it's all just programmatic and it's just a great tool inside of Blender. Um, so once we're done, Updating all, all all the information we have in there, um, we have a nice little tool called the batch render. Um, so, uh, depending on which item you have selected, so in this instance, I want the parent collection. So I go down to our, our batch render tool. I'm switching over from images or items into collections, setting it to an animation render, and then I'm hitting the one button, uh, and we're getting little pop-up window that says Blender is going to be unresponsive while it's rendering, but it's going to render out all nine individual scenes with the randomized backgrounds per scene. Um, and it's a one, one button solution for us. So we don't have to uh, go through any type of hassle of setting up individual renders. We're hitting one button and we're getting all the outputs for those scenes that we saw in OBS. Another event that uh, we've provided support for is Nexus 24, which is a pretty major event uh, It involves a whole lot of our clients and that kind of thing. And they needed an events package. 
Uh, and you may have kind of seen this in the, the website as well. Uh, this is one of the concepts that we were working on, just using a field of like turbulent noise that was displacing all of these tiny little threads and the gradient of colors was constantly changing and the, the logo could be cut out of that or revealed by it and that kind of thing. And that entire system is just based on a signed distance field, an SDF, uh, where we're using just geometry built in Blender to uh, give us a, you know, a, a very good texture that we could then use in a myriad of ways within the material editor, combined with a lot of geometry nodes to then give us the animation controls to show and hide and reveal the logo in different ways and use this as kind of a universal element throughout the entire event. So these are the opening titles for the event, kind of playing off the idea of DNA and that kind of thing, uh, but then kind of like just showing that exploding out into an entire field of threads. Um, and then of course using that uh, to then reveal the, the actual title of the event. Um, but using this system, it was incredibly efficient to build out a huge number of elements for an awards show, a bunch of different speakers over multiple days, uh, and that entire package is then simply batch rendered uh, out of Blender. All of these motion graphics are exclusively and entirely Blender. So that's how, <laughs> how we've been approaching some of our more efficient requirements for motion graphics, ensuring that we build out systems that are going to allow us to create stuff in a way that is dynamic and generative. Uh, but there are some limitations to using Blender for all of your motion graphics. Uh, things like font compatibility, like a lot of designs are using uh, variable width fonts and that doesn't play well. Even if you get a static version of a variable width font, that can be a little bit of a challenge because then there are often like layers overlapping and you have to fix everything in FontForge and now there are multiple posts on Stack Exchange trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, character kerning can also be a little bit of a challenge because the, the text object in Blender supports, you know, manual kerning of text. That's fantastic. But it's outputting of just a plain mesh. So if you want to in, animate individual characters, they're no longer grouped as instances. So if you use the text object in geometry nodes to generate everything, that's awesome. Now you have, you know, per character instances. You can animate everything really easily. But unfortunately, you don't have kerning. So good luck with that. Uh, and of course, as much as, you know, I have a hammer, everything I see is a nail now. Um, Blender isn't always the right tool set for every job, and you, we want to make sure that we are still using a, a huge variety of tools and picking what's truly right for the job. Even though Blender is often the right tool for the job, sometimes it just doesn't have the capabilities we need. Thankfully, sometimes we can actually build those capabilities, and that's where our internal resources come in. We have a lot of you know, little scripts and utilities and stuff. And over the summer, we've converted all of that over to Blender 4.2 extensions, uh, which are now available uh, for free on GitHub. So feel free to uh, download them. Keep it in mind, this is an in, you know, internal set of tools. So uh, at this point, I've been adding features faster than I can document anything. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> Uh, but it's something that we use day to day uh, and helps with a lot of our, you know, graphic design production, a lot of our motion graphics production, and of course, of course, most of all, all of our tech art as well for platforms like augmented reality and mixed reality and virtual reality. So, yeah, um, can't say that it's necessarily a universal tool set that helps everyone, but uh, things like being able to tie timeline markers into drivers so that way you can just change your entire animation simply by rearranging markers in the timeline and everything updates automatically. Uh, that can be a really helpful tool for projects like this, like this very presentation itself. But yeah, I think that's it. So that's, yeah, that's going to do it for us. So I just want to say thank you to uh, Blender for, for hosting us. Um, and I want to thank our, our amazing design team that we have back at launch because um, none of these graphics would have been here without, that, without their support. So, and, and thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it. Um, so if you have, have any questions or anything, we'll, uh, we're happy to answer questions.
Do you guys also develop other tools for um, changing things in between Blender and other programs like After Effects or Premiere? Um, could you go into some of your workflow behind that as well? Um, right now, we, we have delivery kit that we use for automated delivery in and out of some real-time 3D packages. We don't uh, build our own export systems for the most part. Um, we have done some like things like CSV, so uh, just recently, like I had to build out tool sets for transferring spline data from Blender into Unity. So we had actual Unity splines. Um, and so that was really helpful on a current client project that we're working on. Uh, so we do a little bit of that. Um, there are existing tool sets for transferring to and from After Effects. So we, we haven't needed that personally. Thank you all.